Well, you know, I, I, I am a product of the space age. I, I was born in the 50s uh, when humans were just beginning to think about flying in space. There was a, an environment of um, uh, newness and, and, and excitement, and there was a lot of science, science fiction. And um, there was also a, uh, you know, a tremendous competition between uh, two superpowers. And there were only two. And those two were in front stage, and we all were wondering who was going to be first. And then, you know, one got there first, and then the other one tried to do better, and the one after that uh, a little better, and... You know, and, and, and all these fic fictional characters who, who were um, astronauts um, uh, became uh, real uh, humans, uh, both in the Soviet Union and in the United States. Um, you know, be, they became real, you know, humans that you could, you could see. And uh, they became uh, my heroes. And so um, the, the, the adventure of space was all mixed in there. And somehow technology and science were very much interconnected to enable that, uh, that dream, that, uh, that, that, that capability. I wrote a letter to uh, Von Braun uh, because I, there was a, a brochure that came, came, came to my hands, <clears throat> a, a brochure from NASA. Uh, and the brochure said, should you be a rocket scientist? And, you know, I say, yeah, sure, I, I'd love to be one. And uh, the opportunities were, uh, you know, right to NASA, and NASA was uh, uh, in a very uh, steep growth. Um, they, they were in incentivizing uh, youngsters to move into the, into the sciences. And I just didn't know that it was confined to the United States. It just happened to come to my hands. I, I happened to live in Costa Rica, and I said, hmm, this is okay for me, too. So, so I wrote a letter, and uh, I, I was surprised to see that I actually got a response. A few, uh, few months later, the response came. And in that response, uh, they were very carefully uh, pointed out that careers with, with NASA were um, uh, only limited to United States citizens. And my poor understanding of the English language at the time, through a translator, uh, that didn't come quite uh, in a negative way to me. Uh, I basically basically interpreted that they said, well, you just need to come to the United States and, and, you know, become a citizen of the United States and then, you know, you can get a job. And that was um, a very simple formula for me. I have to go to the United States. And that was uh, what set my north at, at, that, at that point. Uh, you know, this is what I have to do. And so I did it. I, 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 I convinced my dad to get me a, a ticket to the United States, and he got me a one-way ticket. He was very wise. He knew, because he had been an immigrant himself, he knew how hard it was to be away from home for a long time in a strange country. Uh, he went to Venezuela, so he could speak the language, but he knew that uh, the language was gonna be a real problem. And he was right. And I can tell you that if, if I had that ticket, the return ticket, I would have taken it. I would have come, I would have gone back. It was a time, um, it was very difficult. Um, and it was the only thing that saved me from heading back, um, and giving up. My paternal grandfather was uh, from China. That's right. He, uh, uh, he um, uh, was one of the early uh, revolutionaries in the in the um, in the sort of the the ragtag army of uh, Dr. Sun Yat-sen, who started the the, um, the Chinese Revolution. This is way before the uh, the uh, separation between the the nationalists and the communist uh, parties uh, 
this is at the very beginning, uh, the transition from the uh, Chinese uh, dynasty, the, the empire, and the beginning of the republic. And uh, he was uh, persecuted and uh, flee, uh, he, he, fleed, uh, he, he ran away from China with persecution. And he ended up in, the, in Costa Rica, in uh, Central America. Settled down there, and that's where he married my uh, grandmother. And that's where my father came from. My grandfather was intending to go to Hawaii, along with all the other uh, uh, Chinese, uh, you know, early revolutionaries. Uh, and presumably the regrouping and the re reorganization of the revolution was going to take place in Hawaii. Uh, many didn't make it. Uh, they were all hiding in, ch in ships. Uh, he ended up in, in Central America, and that's where he settled. Uh, just didn't, didn't work out. In the 60s, um, the relationship between the United States and Latin America was a very strong relationship. Uh, because of President Kennedy's uh, uh, big program called the Alliance for Progress, there was a lot of activity going on uh, sponsored by the United States in the American embassies all over the uh, uh, South American cont continent were, were very active in promoting you know, U.S. technology. There was a, there was a, a tremendous sense of um, uh, participation and, and uh, sharing. Um, and uh, I obtained that uh, brochure from the uh, U.S. Embassy. Uh, the U.S. Embassy was spreading out these, uh, these brochures for uh, schools, to, uh, for educational institutions, and they, they came to my hands. And uh, it was probably serendipity that, I, that I, it came to me because there were probably not a lot of them, but... Um, but I was, uh, I was fortunate to see that. I was also, uh, very, um, you know, moved by another, um, uh, ex exposition that came to the United States, sponsored, uh, to, to Costa Rica, sponsored by the U.S. And that was, um, uh, uh it was in the, in the uh, late 60s, um, it, it was called a Atoms for Peace. And it was a promotion of the, um, the use of nuclear power for pa pacific purposes, you know, for peace, peace, peaceful pur purposes. And um, that um, uh, exposition came and stayed in, uh, in Costa Rica for several weeks. And uh, you could go in there. They had a, an inflatable uh, uh, dome that, that was really amazing. And in, inside of it, they had all kinds of demonstrations of nuclear power, how it worked. And, of course, I knew a lot of that myself. I already studied a lot of the nuclear uh, power uh, concepts. And I spent uh, long hours um, uh, during most of the time that that uh, exposition was in the country uh, just soaking it all in and, and asking a lot of questions. I remember that I asked uh, one, one of the guys, I asked him about uh, thermonuclear fusion, and he didn't uh, know what it was. <laughs> he wasn't, too, he wasn't too, um, too up on that. But they were very much promoting fission, fission power, you know, uh, conventional nuclear power. That was, that was a, 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 big, uh, a big thing. When I entered uh, the university at, at the University of Connecticut, I, I was an engineering student. And um, my goal was to get a degree in aerospace or mechanical engineering and then join NASA. That was the goal. But uh, this is in the early uh, 70s, 69, 70, uh, 73 is when I graduated. But in, the, in 71, in 69, uh, you know, humans landed on the moon, and that was something that I was extremely important to me because I was, I felt that I was just that little bit closer to, to my goal, right? Um, but, um, uh, a couple of years later, uh, President Nixon basically canceled the program. And there were, uh, you know, thousands of engineers with PhDs who were out of work. 
And my professors at uh, UConn uh, essentially discouraged me from going into the space program. He said, Franklin, don't, don't, don't even think about uh, going to the space program. Because you're not going to get a job. And I'm, I'm glad I didn't pay attention to that. But, um, but I did, it, it did cause me to think, um, to, to tweak the, you know, the game plan that I had in mind. And I had become very involved in, in physics, uh, in experimental physics. Even though I was a, I, I was a, a, an engineering student, I spent most of my time in the physics lab. I learned to be uh, an experimentalist. I learned to work my with my hands. I I was good with my hands anyway, and I became a, a machinist. Uh, I learned to operate the milling machines and the and become a welder, and you know did a lot of those things that involved working and building things. And that's what experimental physicists do. And I kind of got enamored with that field. Even though I was engineering, I became mostly a physicist. And so when I graduated, um, there was a major uh, uh, energy crisis in the United States, really throughout the whole world in 1973. And the focus of uh, energy was very strong. And the space program had, be had become de-emphasized. Uh, sort of NASA kind of went to sleep and energy was all that people would, would talk about. And I wanted to get into energy, nuclear power, nuclear energy was interesting to me. And I wanted to go into thermonuclear research, thermonuclear fusion, because that was the ultimate energy of the stars. And I figured that someday that energy would power uh, rocket engines uh, to go much faster than chemical rockets could do it. So that was uh, what kind of moved me into that direction, and, and uh, I ended up at MIT in the in the in the Department of Nuclear Engineering, uh, studying fusion research, uh, thermonuclear fusion, and then of course plasma physics, which was the the, the core of the study uh, field that um, that you needed to. to to follow. So my MIT thesis was a, a review of um, the technology of fusion. Uh, you know, there had been a lot of research in the physics of fusion. How does the fusion reaction really take place by compressing a plasma and, you know, heating it to extreme temperatures? But the question is, how do you really build something that can uh, can do this and can do it uh, <clears throat> in a in an eff efficient way? Can you produce electricity from it? So the engineering of fusion was what what my thesis was about, and that um, you know brought me uh, you know just straight into the field of how to make plasma devices really work. And that was the genesis of the Vasimir engine. And of course, I was interested in space. And so I began to kind of morph into that field. Could we build, if we don't build a fusion reactor, could we build a plasma rocket? Maybe we don't need fusion to make it work. Eventually, we could, that, that rocket could become a fusion rocket. But for now, we are happy with it being just a plasma, a plasma device, a plasma rocket that would be driven by something else, by some electrical power source that you could feed from somewhere else. Maybe a nuclear reactor, maybe a solar uh, um, array. And that was sort of what my mind began to you know, move towards. Could we use the technology of fusion to develop a very amazing rocket, but not quite a fusion rocket. That's what happened when I went to uh, to Draper Labs to work. It was uh, my job was uh, 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 basically developing control systems for fusion reactors. And you know, I said, "Well, fine, I can do that. I can work on that." But I also was interested 
in how do you make a plasma rocket? You need a magnet. You need something to heat the plasma. Uh, you need uh, to be able to manage very, very extreme temperatures. Uh, and you need to make it very lightweight, very compact. Uh, and you need, need to make it efficient, obviously. And those were engineering um, uh, issues that I had to, to deal with uh, for fusion reactors. But I also was able to uh, focus on on the engine. And, and little by little, my mind kind of just navigated into that. And I just became fascinated by it. And I began to work on it more and more. And right at the very end of the, my, my um, activity, my, my work at Draper Labs, uh, that's when I was selected by NASA. And I just said, well, you know, this is just a perfect segue. Uh, I, this is what I want to do. And, and, and so when I started um, in the astronaut program, I, I just uh, felt that I had to continue on this research, and I, and I did. And, I was, um, and it was uh, very fortuitous because, um, you know, many of the astronauts who came um, into the shuttle program from scientific um, uh, fields uh, basically, um, you know, kind of divorced themselves from their fields, and they became more of, uh, you know, astronaut operators of of the uh, of the spacecraft. I didn't want I I didn't want to give that up. I didn't want to give up, you know, my desire to 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 uh, nurture this this research and. I somehow managed to keep the, keep it alive, and the uh, the leadership at uh, NASA and the astronaut uh, office uh, was uh, was very uh, agreeable to doing this, and uh, I was able to give uh, get permission to uh, conduct the research, even though I was training to to fly in space. So I, I ended up having two jobs really. I I. Um, I started the research um, when, when I joined NASA. Uh, I was at the Johnson Space Center, but the first experiments in the Bassimer engine were at MIT. I, I had a laboratory at MIT, and I used to go every month to MIT to spend uh, maybe a week or a week and a half or so doing research and then come back and continue my training. So I was, was able to kind of keep that sort of double hat Eventually, it became uh, too too hard to do that, and uh, I convinced uh, the NASA leadership to let me uh, bring the laboratory from MIT to the Johnson Space Center, and that was uh, not an easy job. For one thing, um, the Johnson Space Center uh, was not supposed to be doing uh, propulsion uh, research in propulsion. Certainly not an electric propulsion, which is, which this is what it was. And the second thing was um, that being an astronaut was a little bit of a handicap because astronauts are not supposed to really be doing, um, you know, leading uh, laboratories and, 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 and doing this, this sort of research. Uh, I, I, I had to find a way to kind of break those molds. And but but the NASA leadership was agreeable. They, they they were interested and they 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 did support me, and I was able to move the uh, the lab from MIT to the Johnson Space Center. It was uh, it was complicated, I had a lot of hoops that had to go through, but uh, we managed to get it done, and uh, the the result was uh, was pretty awesome. We. Uh, we ended up building a team of about 50 scientists from um, several of the national laboratories, mostly uh, labs at, uh, at, uh, at Oak Ridge uh, in Tennessee and uh, Los Alamos in New Mexico. There were several universities involved, and a lot of these folks came to the, to the, to the field with their own money. Uh, you know, from their own programs. Uh, somehow they, we were able to accrete a lot of these efforts together into one, um, 
single project. And the uh, physics of the Vasimir uh, was then developed. The understanding of the controlling physics of the, of the engine was, was developed in about a decade. We were, we were in that laboratory operating for 10 years. And, and, and then, um, that, you know, in those 10 years, I was also flying in space. Uh, so, so again, the, the double, the two hat, um, you know, nature of my, my job was, was still there. But I mean, it was not just me working on this. It was a lot of people. And the, the, the result that you see in, 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 in what we have today is not just me. It's the work of, of a lot of people who have uh, spent a lot of their uh, best um, years, uh, you know, uh, supporting this project. First, you know, what, what, what is a plasma? The way I think I describe a plasma is just uh, essentially a soup of charged particles. It's just a, a, a gas, you know, a gas is a collection of particles, but in a plasma, the particles are electrically charged. They have negative and positive charges. And you know, how, how do they get that way? Well, you got to get it very hot. So in order to go from plasma to, uh, from gas to plasma, you have to really pump up the temperature, you have to make it very hot. So plasma typically starts at uh, maybe 11,000 degrees, um, and it goes up from there. Uh, and uh, I'm we're talking degrees centigrade, but eventually it doesn't matter what degrees you talk about. Um, so the plasmas that we typically work with in our facility are maybe four to five million degrees. So these are very hot substances. Of course, they're very uh, diffuse. The density is, is rather low. It's lower than the density of the air that we're breathing. So these plasmas exist essentially in a vacuum chamber. That's where you, you make them, and, and they operate in a vacuum chamber. And so um, the Vasimer is a plasma rocket. So what it shoots out the back is just a, a hot plasma. And the question that people always struggle with is how do you contain those very hot temperatures, the very high temperatures? There's no material capable of withstanding those temperatures. And uh, the way we do that is the way we do it, in, they, they do it in fusion, is they uh, use magnetic fields. So we use, uh, in essence, uh, a very carefully tailored magnetic, you know, pipe. Um, which has a, a very, very unique shape, which allows the plasma to do things that we want it to do. And, um, and so the magnetic field, um, doesn't melt. So, uh, we really don't have a limit to how hot we can make this plasma. Now, now there is, there is a, a physical casing. Okay. There's, I mean, the, there's the, the magnetic field uh, is there, but there is an ou outer, uh, you know, tube, uh, outer tube that has to be made out of, uh, you know, very um, strong ceramic materials that withstand thousands of degrees in temperature. And then just a few centimeters from this very hot environment, you have a, a magnet, which is the magnet that's producing the field. That magnet is extremely cold, extremely cold. It is a superconductor. The magnet that we operate today is five degrees Kelvin. It's like 268 degrees centigrade below zero. So extremely uh, cold. And so the question is, how, how do you keep something so hot, so close to something so uh, cold? And that, that, that sort of layering stratification of the, of the temperature is a real challenge. And it is the, 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 the bulk of our work, uh, is to maintain that temperature stratification. And so that the rocket can operate very hot while the magnet stays very cold. So, um, and the other question people ask is, you know, how do you, how do you heat something? 
And, and, and the thing that we, that we use is, is, is we use, we use electromagnetic waves. Sort of the, the, the way you, you heat your, your, your coffee or your soup in a microwave oven, you know, you put it in there and push the button and the soup gets hot, but the cup doesn't get hot. Why is that? Well, the waves have a certain particular features to it that they only go where you want them to go, and they only get absorbed by the material that you want uh, the energy to go into. In our case, we want the energy to go into the plasma. And so we launch these waves uh, with antennas, with sort of uh, structures of antennas around the rocket that penetrate through the ceramic. Uh, so the ceramic, in theory, doesn't get hot because of the waves. It does get hot, but for other reasons. But the waves penetrate through the ceramic, and they go right into the plasma, and they get absorbed by the plasma, and the plasma gets really hot. So that is the, uh, the basic uh, uh, physics, the basic fundamentals. And the rest is just rockets. You shoot the stuff out, out the back. <laughs> And it goes as fast as you can get it to go. It goes really fast. And that gives you a tremendous uh, rocket. Um, much better than any chemical rocket that you could imagine. We do see plasma rockets now more than, than before. Um, but they are very uh, low power. These are little thrusters. Uh, they're called ion engines. Uh, there's another a type of plasma thruster called the, the Hall thruster. These are, these are, these are, uh, plasma. They're, these are all plasma engines, but they're very low power. And the reason is that there is not a lot of electricity out there in space and it's very hard to, to make a lot of electricity. So the, 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 the technology for plasma propulsion or electric propulsion has evolved in a, in a kind of, um, an environment of, 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 um, of, uh, low electricity diet, you know. So you, you have to make these, uh, um, these, these gadgets be very low power because that's all the power you have. But this is changing and we anticipated this change when we started to work on Vasimir. We anticipated that the availability of electrical power was going to change, um, eventually, uh, in the form of much better uh, solar arrays and eventually nuclear reactors, nuclear uh, power sources that could provide the uh, hundreds of kilowatts to multi-megawatts of power that you need to really drive a plasma engine like, like ours. So we kind of anticipated this. And, and, and it's turning out that, um, that, that we were right. I think that this is happening right now. Uh, even today, plasma engines are becoming more and more powerful. Uh, we decided to go for the high power engine to, to begin with. And, you know, the Vasimir does not scale down to low power. Um, it just, it just doesn't, doesn't, it, it, it doesn't, it's not an efficient rocket to operate at low power. It, it likes to be, um, it likes to have the, the, the high power environment. I, I think of it as the diesel engine, you know. The, yeah, the way, the way I see a mission to Mars, uh, you know, I, I, I don't believe that a mission to Mars is, um, robust. Uh, unless it is driven by nuclear power. I think a chemical mission to Mars, a chemical rocket to go to Mars is possible. Uh, and, you know, people, uh, landed, we've, we've landed, uh, uh, uh robots and, and sensors on Mars. So, so the technology to go to Mars is there, but, but not a technology that would enable humans to fly there in a, in a robust and in, in a reliable way, um, and it would be a very fragile mission, in my opinion. 
uh, this, the humans would suffer a great deal of, of, of deconditioning and, you know, debilitation. It's just a very rough mission to go the way we, we have, the technology we have. So with a plasma engine and a nuclear electric device, uh, the transportation to Mars could be much faster, much, much faster. We're talking about maybe getting there in a couple of months, as opposed to maybe seven or eight months that it would take a, 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 a chemical rocket to, to do this journey. The nuclear reactor to provide the electricity to, the en to an engine that can do that doesn't exist. So clearly we have a lot of work to do. It, it, it's work that we should have started a long time ago, but people have been uh, a little timid about the use of nuclear in space, nuclear power in space. That, uh, you know, that fear seems to be waning a little bit. Uh, people are beginning to pay attention to nuclear power. Uh, particularly now that we have all these problems on Earth that have to do with uh, the burning of fossil fuels, and uh, nu nuclear seems to have a be getting a little resurgence in the in, in the acceptance of the public. But uh, clearly, there is no way we are going to go to Mars and beyond in a in a sustainable way uh, unless we have nuclear power. And certainly uh, beyond Mars, uh, solar power is totally beyond the question. Uh, it's just the sun is just not a, a reasonable factor for powering anything that, that would support human human uh, habitability. So, so that's the. Uh, but but you know to build the ship that um, that goes to Mars, it's going to be a multinational effort. Is Probably going to be done in a, in a sort of a lunar shipyard, you know, not on the surface of the moon, but it's going to be done somewhere in, you know, in the vicinity of the moon, probably in one of the Lagrange points. And it will be an effort that requires, um, a commercial infrastructure of transportation and logistics from low earth orbit to where the moon, to where this this activity is because you've got to be able to transport the equipment, the supplies, the materials, and the people, you know, across the uh, Earth Moon environment. And this is what Ad Astra is trying to do right now. The, the Vasimir engine, we're not developing it just to go to Mars. Mars is not a good business right now. The business is the, the logistics business, the trucking business um, of um, cislunar space. That is, the, that is what we're pointing to right now in our company. And then we also see that, um, that the moon itself is a, a waypoint that is very needed to test uh, the, the long duration firings of rockets uh, like the Vasmer uh, at multi-megawatts. I mean, you have a plasma engine like the one we're testing here is only 100 kilowatts, and testing this engine in this chamber is a real challenge, extremely difficult. Um, now that's only 100, 100 kilowatts. Now um, one megawatt Right, we're talking about ten times, right? And and that that would be ten times the chamber uh, output capability, uh, maybe maybe much bigger size. Now NASA has some of these uh, capabilities, but it would be very expensive to test. And then if we're talking about an engine for Mars, we're talking about me multi megawatts. We're talking ten megawatts. That would be a hundred times the size of this chamber. Uh, it's very hard to do this in, on Earth. And by then, the moon will be developed to the point that uh, testing on the moon will be a lot more, um, you know, maybe realistic in a sense. People seem to be a little taken by the idea of testing on the moon. Back in the um, early 90s, people were very... Um, 
sort of um, reticent to consider testing uh, technologies uh, that were not quite proven uh, on the International Space Station. Well, now that's, that's what the space station is for. And, uh, and now that, that has come to pass, uh, and now the moon will be next. The moon will be the place for testing. I, I, I was fascinated by hydrogen um, way back when I was in, in, in um, my undergraduate uh, 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 career. It's learning about the potential of hydrogen for so many things and how hydrogen was everywhere. It's in the hydrocarbons, the petroleum, all the oil that we burn is full of hydrogen. You know, plastics are full of hydrogen. Uh, is in the food that we eat. Is is uh, the, the, that's why they call it uh, carbohydrates. It's, it's, called, it's got a lot of hydrogen, and um, and it's just everywhere. But it's always tied to something. And the trick on hydrogen is to dislodge it, to dis, dis you know detach it from whatever it's attached to. Obviously, water is a big source of hydrogen. And um, when we were flying in space, the space shuttle was an electric vehicle, um, and it ran on hydrogen, uh, fuel cells. The space shuttle had three fuel cells. And we had hydrogen uh, tanks on board. And of course, we had oxygen as well, because because you there's no oxygen up there. So, so we had hydrogen and oxygen, and then we would mix the hydrogen and oxygen in the fuel cell, and the fuel cells would produce electricity, but they would also produce water, clean, pure water, which we drank. And, you know, to me, this was a, this was a, a real appreciation for how space technology could change uh, life on Earth. And this is what we're doing right now, taking the fuel cells that were developed uh, in the space program back in the 60s. Now they are in thousands of vehicles, uh, in roads and, you know, um, and, and even in, in, in trains and, and uh, even some, some ships now. Um, and, and the world is moving to a hydrogen economy. And I believe in that. And I believe that the way to make hydrogen sustainably is by using the large amounts of solar energy and wind and, and the renewable energy that we have uh, coming to us every day from the sun. And that we can use uh, that energy to um, break up water uh, and store the hydrogen. And that when we use the hydrogen, we get the water back and the water that we can drink. So I just, I, I am totally convinced on, on this, and this is one of the things we're trying to do in Costa Rica. We started uh, this about 10 years ago, and we, we you know, uh, built the first ecosystem uh, with uh, solar, wind, uh, and uh, what, what, what's called green hydrogen, hydrogen produced from electrolysis of water. And we uh, now have uh, a bus, uh, which runs on hydrogen, and we have uh, four electric fuel cell vehicles uh, operating, and we're trying to scale it up, and the whole world is, is doing this. Uh, we were very much pioneers in this field uh, 10 years ago, but now we're seeing a lot of others uh, coming, coming along, and we're very happy to see, because I know that uh, when, we, when we dig ditches on the moon and we transport cargo on the moon, we're not going to be using diesel trucks. <laughs> We're going to be using hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles. And we're going to be using probably hydrogen uh, uh, um, as a means of storing energy uh, on, on the moon and, and, uh, and also on Mars. Well, NASA, NASA still carries a big punch. I mean, NASA is a big player and by far. Uh, <clears throat> now, it's not that NASA is getting behind is that the others are catching up. And, you know, it is, it is very good to see, and it, it, it was unavoidable, uh, it's unavoidable to keep, uh, you know, information is now f freely flowing throughout the whole planet. 
uh, people know what uh, what what technology is. So you have to do is uh, if you don't know, you have you can Google it or you can get on YouTube and you can learn all about how to do anything you want. Um, so so technology and information is quite uh, readily available everywhere, and so people are, are are smart and and so lots of people are catching up, and this is great. That means that uh, that more brain, more brain power, more technology, more development. And I think that uh, NASA has uh, done a really good job in ushering this, um, you know, th 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 this movement. Uh, and NASA in, in and of itself has become, um, was, was, was the only player maybe, or one of two. Now it's just one of many. And that there's nothing wrong with that. It's, 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 a, it's a good thing. It's a good thing to see other countries moving into this field. And, and certainly the, the private sector, there's a lot of money in the private sector. Uh, and the profit motive is a very strong force that is driving a lot of things. Uh, and it reduces the burden on the, on the American taxpayer. Uh, I mean, this is a human endeavor. This is a, uh, you know, we're talking about the entire planet. So when we go to Mars, is a human adventure. We need to shed this sort of antiquated uh, vision of just countries, individual countries, um, without sacrificing our individuality and our ethnicity. We are all humans. And we're going to go to Mars as humans. And maybe this is the way we can find peace on this, on this planet and learn to live together rather than fighting uh, over some silly borders that um, nobody really recognizes anyway. I think what drives that innovation and curiosity is um, really the, uh, the absence of fear. Uh, the curiosity and inquisitiveness that you see in a baby. And the, the more that, that we are like children, the more innovative that we will be. Uh, in, in, in some ways, I tell people that I, I never grew up. I, I kind of feel that way. Uh, I, I did get a, a bunch of bumps and bruises, uh, but I, maybe they were not, maybe you have a, a thick head or something, but they were not enough to, 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 to keep me from trying. And uh, I think that uh, in order to be innovative, you have to be, uh, to be very um, uh, persistent. Uh, you have to learn to fail. It's what I tell people. To succeed, you have to learn to fail. And I have had many failures. And um, most of the things that I've tried have failed. It's just that, uh, you know, people like to see the success. But you have to learn to fail in order to succeed. Well, you know, I think extra extraterrestrials are probably there somewhere. In the universe, it would be silly for us to think that we're the only ones. Uh, but it's, it's still a ways maybe before we find one of them or get to, get to see them.